so welcome everybody to this uh, webinar on crisis recovery and transformation. Um, we are very glad that you made the time to be here with us today. So I would like to introduce the speakers. Um, I'm sorry, because I still see people in the waiting room. Um, so my name is Ingrid Gafkev. Uh, I'm the leadership portfolio manager for the uh, Geneva Leadership Alliance, and I will be the moderator today. Together with Renzo, we'll be monitoring the chat, as he mentioned, um, and I will be introducing also the speakers. So uh, we are here today with uh, Patrick Sweet, uh, David Horovin, and Peter uh, Cunningham. So I would like to ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, thank you, Ingrid. Um, my name is Patrick Sweet. Uh, I'm co-director of the Geneva Leadership Alliance. Um, I'm with the, which is a, an association alliance between the Center for Creative Leadership and the Geneva Center for Security Policy. I'm from the Center for Creative Leadership. Uh, I've been working uh, in organization leadership development for some 35 years. I'm calling in from Sweden where we are voluntarily locking down, uh, uh, different than some other places. And uh, personally, COVID has sort of uh, hit me uh, uh, close. I haven't lost any uh, dear friends, but I've had several landed in the hospital. So um, this, this uh, uh, webinar is very timely. We've done a couple of other ones, and I look forward to contributing, and hopefully it'll make a difference for some of the things that you do. And with that, David? Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks, Patrick. So uh, my name is David Horobin. I'm head of crisis management at the GCSP. Uh, I've been at uh, GCSP now for, for three years. Previously, I was head of security and crisis management uh, for about eight years at the, at the ICRC uh, in a career of around 20 years uh, at, the, at the Red Cross Red Crescent. Also worked for the uh, British government as uh, director of operations at DFID. Um, and look forward to talking to you later on around uh, the phases and challenges that we have in this uh, in this current crisis and some general issues around what we can learn and apply around crisis management. And with that, I'll hand over to Peter. Hello, good morning. Sorry, I'm off mute now. Yeah. Um, my name is Peter Cunningham. I'm the head of the leadership cluster here at GCSP and I also co-direct together with Patrick the Geneva Leadership Alliance. Um, I've, uh, in the last 20 years, I think I've, uh, I've worked across the public sector, private sector, non-profit sector, with a focus on leadership, on strategy, uh, on executive coaching. So um, I hope to bring some of those experiences uh, to bear today. Um, and also for the last six years now, uh, uh, really focusing on the peace, security, development community uh, here at GCSP. Um, I have a, a very personal interest as well in, in seeing us navigate these times. My, my partner and I are expecting our first child in October, um, so I uh, am compelled to take a hopeful, positive view uh, of the way forward in the future. And, and, and um, what I'm hoping to do today is also share a practical view with you, so you take something away that is useful to you. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. So I would like just to explain you a bit more about the, the Alliance, the Geneva Leadership Alliance. So four years ago, uh, the Geneva Center for Security Policy and the Center for Creative Leadership co-founded in partnership the Geneva Leadership Alliance. So both bring uh, 70 years of experience in leading with innovation in their respective spaces. Uh, we built a network around of partners and collaborators that bring expertise from many different angles. And today's is a good example of how we combine different experts into, into a webinar to cover the topic of um, leadership and uh, transformation. We, what we do is to equip individuals and teams and organizations um, to have the mindset and skills and tools to navigate today's challenges. So definitely the, the topics we are gonna cover today are more relevant than ever. And with further ado, I would like to jump into the agenda. So today we will start with um, introducing that concept of the new normal and how that is affecting ourselves. Um, we'll after have another 20 minutes um, uh, trying to understand where we are now and what's coming. And um, on the third part of the session, we will have 
a space to talk about mindset and practices um, for, for a positive approach into the situation. Uh, followed by a recap where we will open the floor for questions and actually um, la would like to hear from, from you, from your own experiences. So I will hand over to Patrick for him to start with the first space of the webinar. All right. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, you know, as some of you might hear from my voice, um, I'm not Swedish. I, I come from North America. And in my life, um, I've seen uh, several uh, crises um, from 1985 when in the United States, there was a, I was raised in Michigan, there was a severe uh, unemployment upwards of 15% uh, or greater in the Michigan, uh, Ohio, Indiana area. Uh, we're starting to experience that now globally with COVID, but that was certainly a crisis uh, that uh, I was involved in working and consulting at that time. Thousand, we all experienced this uh, strange dot-com kind of uh, financial thing that happened um, in 2008. We saw it even bigger than that. Um, and uh, I look at this uh, in light of this COVID crisis, in light of you know, of course, my history and those particular points in my lifetime when um, uh, things have, have caused me to rethink and caused me to recognize perhaps how, how small I am. Um, and in so doing and working with a lot of organizations, hundreds, through this period up until now, uh, it's pretty clear that um, uh, what we do right now and when we're in crisis, I've seen afterwards, it defines your leadership, it defines your people and your culture for the next decade. Um, every organization has an origin story. If you take Apple, uh, if you take um, ICRC, if you take uh, uh, Mercedes-Benz, uh, if you take the UN, everything has an origin story. And that story lives until there's some kind of large event, a crisis. David's gonna explain a bit the difference between an emergency and a crisis, and I think it's an important distinction. Um, I won't go into that, but let's just call it a significant event that acts as a punctuation point for people in that organization. It's that they look um, for the people who were there beforehand, they then go through uh, a crisis, and they begin to punctuate the trajectory of that organization from that place forward. There was the origin and then this happened and it moved forward. Um, a, a specific example of that in, in, uh, is with a client that we've been working with recently who uh, came to us, the Alliance, Geneva Leadership, and asked us if we would help them with a leadership development strategy. And they had many things worked out. They had some very clear ideas about what they were going to do. They wanted to build agility, for example, and they had four areas of agility to look at. And we said, sure, that sounds good. We'd love to help. Can we go in and ask some questions about um, agility? Because agility, you're seeing as a competence, and we see it as an outcome. Uh, we see it as something that is getting in the way of agility. Um, yes, you might be able to develop competencies for it, but you're asking for it in the end as an outcome. So let's ask what's getting in the way. And we found out by going in and having focus, focus groups and things, uh, talking with uh, over 50 people out of 900, uh, having a focus group with uh, close to another 50 or so. So we had a good slice of the organization and people were referring to an event that happened almost a decade earlier that was uh, it spontaneously brought up. They would say um, people even who were not part of the organization at that time would say, well, back in this particular date, um, I, you know, these things happen and I've been told to be careful. I've been told that we need to keep our head down. I've been told that we probably shouldn't speak up around certain ways and certain things. Even when these person weren't, these people were not in or part of that uh, existential crisis. It was a severe crisis. It required radical attention for that organization. It wasn't a global crisis, but it was an existential one for that. And my point is, it acted as a punctuation point that got in the way of very many things close to a decade later. We were eight years afterwards when we came in, roughly. And so that's an example, and there are many others, 
uh, where um, uh, if you look at Apple computer when Steve Jobs was fired and they went into a crisis and then it's been punctuated since Stephen came back. Um, uh, those kinds of things, they work as punctuation points and they set your culture for a long time. What happens in that process and what we wanna do is point out that um, in a crisis, and Dave will go into this, there is an acute strain, there is a, uh, uh, a failure. We don't know if it's temporary, we don't know if it's existential, but it's very acute and it affects everybody in the organization. With COVID, it's COVID is affecting everybody in every organization. And so that's having an impact on us. And what we're seeing in the Alliance is how people react to that um, is really setting the stage forward. And we can think about that in terms of how we look at our own governments, how we look at different governments. Um, what it hits specifically is the cultural side of our organizations. It hits specifically how we trust and how we learn. It hits specifically when we see leaders making decisions in crisis. It, it, we, we, wonder if they see what we see. It hits our resilience. It's, it's a, a, a game that takes a long time to go through. It's, it's stressful. This one is one of the most stressful I've been. Um, it impacts these two things, the way we take risks in our organizations. All of a sudden, we might become very risk averse when we, might, when we might need to be trying new things, like the Geneva Leadership Alliance is trying to do many new things with new medium now. Everybody's having mediums and, and try new, uh, experiments with new things. It infects our, uh, uh, our sense of psychological safety. Um, do we have a job tomorrow? Will we, will we become sick? Um, and all of these things impact our culture and how we lead through those is pretty fundamental. And if we take radical actions that break down trust, it takes a long time to bring it back. If we forget that um, it takes uh, uh, stamina and we, we don't pace ourselves, it's gonna uh, catch up with us. If we, if we try to shut down all risk taking, we might find that we become irrelevant. Now Peter's gonna speak specifically about those things a little bit later, about practices to address trust and risk and learning and, and things. Um, I'm lifting them up because uh, we don't often think that right now those are some essential elements of how you lead as a leader, that if you're not paying attention to those, if you're paying attention to what you need to pay attention to as well in the crisis, you may overlook these, and these may live long after we come out of COVID. So that's part. So what can you do about that? Um, well, one of the things that we do is we start asking questions, and we've done this in our own organization, about where are we? Um, what's on our mind? And we set around a few questions to see where people are, uh, not from the uh, organizational structural standpoint, but what is on their mind? And we ask them to answer two questions. Um, what's most challenging, and, and what do you wish you understood better? And these are the words that came back. It's a simple test uh, that you send out a question, and the size of the word, uh, represents the time, the amount of time it's been, uh, the amount of uh, numbers it's been uh, uh, mentioned. So you see that people are uh, thinking about priorities, they're thinking about working, they're thinking about jobs, values, they're thinking about many personal things. They're thinking about hope, they're thinking about uh, uh, mental capacities, these kinds of things. Um, this is what's on people's mind and we need to make sure that we connect there. But if you have that question, if you take that approach, ask people, it suddenly gets jumbled. And so what we wanted to do was provide uh, some frameworks uh, for organizing that discussion. And so when you look at that Wordle a second ago, you'll find that the level of impact uh, ranged, for, ranged from impacting on the self to impact on my organization to impacting across the, across the whole enterprise. Do we even have a business? Will we exist as a UN? Um, how do we move forward? And then secondly to that, and Dave will speak further about this, is that in these different levels, you have a, a horizontal axis of time. There is, what are we attending to now? Um, uh, what is impending, that's midterm, and uh, what are we intending in the long term? So, you know, you'll have discussions about what's happening in the moment, and they'll be um, colored by what people are fearful of or hoping for in the near term, and often the long term is not necessarily there 
uh, uh, articulated, but in some people who actually are looking long-term, it is that. What we're suggesting is during crisis, these conversations should be recognized by level and by time horizon so that you can have coherent conversations. The conversations at the individual level in the first two uh, uh, phases, if you will, what you're uh, attending to in the moment has to do with vulnerabilities and strengths. You know, am I going to get through this? And you'll hear people talking about that. As a leader, you need to figure out how to help them both identify those strengths and use them and um, address their vulnerabilities. At the mid-level in here, we're talking about how do we separate uh, urgent responses from things that, for example, actually um, imply business reformation? Do we need new teams? Are we actually just going to adapt with business continuity questions? Um, or are we going to actually change ourselves because it looks like in the long term, we're going to have to do things entirely differently. And so in the Geneva Leadership Alliance, for example, our business continuity was called into question. We can't bring together face to face and that was 90% of everything we did were a convener. We then had to say, okay, well, we need to do it in this medium. Um, but then the pending question is, is this a new medium for working in the long term? And how do we, what does that mean for our teams? And what does that mean for our roles? Uh, and so that has a lot to do with the people in front of you. Um, Ingrid and Renzo and, and David and Patrick and we're all, and Peter, we're all looking at how do our roles adjust to new ways of working and are these long-term going to be that way? And at the enterprise level, um, you've got the same kinds of questions, but you're really talking about, um, are we going to be bringing in new kinds of talents? At the Center for Creative Leadership, we're focusing a lot more on digital and bringing in many more digital designers right now because of this. At the GCSP, for example, there's been some rethinking about, well, maybe this isn't the end. Maybe it's not going to be over in November. And maybe we need to think about how we actually structure and build um, our internal environment where we used to have convening, uh, where people were close. We need to rethink these things. That has asset implications. So what's really important is to recognize that different people are looking at different things. They're looking at it from all three levels at the same time. And what we wanted to do was bring to you a framework to say it's really important to keep these levels in focus, separated yet together. Try not to mix the conversations up um, on inadvertently and try to, if you're talking about business continuity, uh, try to hold separate, you know, what you need to do now from what might actually be new team roles or what might actually be a new business in itself, a new way of organizing and a new way of working. All of this will come down to impact on yourself. You know, what is, what is a better me? What will be a new me? I've had to take some uh, effort to learn to communicate through this medium. Um, I think it's a, it's a, a newer me. We'll see if it's better by, by the results. But um, these are the kinds of things we wanted to bring a framework into and say, when you have these conversations, try to look at the levels of impact that you're talking about, with whom you're speaking, and try to tease out over time what that means. And uh, with that, um, I'd encourage you to, if you have any questions, put them in the, in the chat. Um, and I will turn it over to David, who's going to go into more detail specifically about what to expect during crises in different phases. Patrick, yep. we have a question before we go yep. on. Yep. Um, so there is a question from Mohammed that is asking, leadership in this case depends on a, on a vision about what's going to happen. How do you deal with that, mm. with that uncertainty? I can, I can do a real short, a short uh, opinion answer. Uh, mm -hmm. There is no answer. Um, there is no right or wrong. But one thing that we are learning is that um, uh, um, the organization still has its trajectory. It's probably going to be in the same business that it was in. Um, how it gets done uh, is going to emerge as we sort these things out. Through that emergence and that testing, we may actually modify the vision. So you have to, in some ways, hold on to a direction and hold on to a vision, and at the same time, allow them to emerge. 
because we don't know what will happen in November, December, and January of next year, for example. Okay. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you, uh, thank you, thank you, Patrick. Um, let me um, uh, let me just uh, say a little bit that um, <clears throat> in the 20 years or so I've been uh, working in crisis, uh, I've dealt with uh, many hundreds of different types of crisis, be it uh, natural disasters, earthquakes, epidemics, uh, previous epidemics, and there's a lot to be learned from previous academics. Uh, as well as uh, armed attacks, kidnappings, and, and reputational damage. Uh, and one of the things that I have learned over the years is that uh, successfully navigating your way through such a crisis as we are today is first of all to try and understand where you are um, within a, a very uncertain, sometimes ambiguous environment, uh, but perhaps most importantly to understand your role and how you're team, if you're working in a crisis management team, um, can work effectively um, in such a, such a crisis. But I think one of the things that um, I want to drill down on for a few minutes, which, which is important and sometimes confusing um, uh, uh, in terms of an effective crisis management team, is really to understand, firstly, you know, what is a crisis? Um, and many CEOs, having gone through uh, a major event, disruptive event, have said, you know, well, one of the things that I really needed to understand is, am I in a crisis? Or do I already have mechanisms, structures that are in place, um, which um, can actually be activated? Now, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of work going on uh, currently within the International Standards Organization and other working groups around trying to define what a crisis is. But uh, for the purposes of this, uh, this discussion, I would say that um, there are four main factors. One is that uh, an event, a disruptive event, comes as a surprise. Um, some people talk about the current COVID situation as being a black swan event. Well, it's not. Uh, it's been on the radar for many years in different countries. However, uh, and there are many different reasons as to why we are where we are now, uh, but we cannot necessarily say it's a surprise. However, the impact of it today, globally, um, has been a surprise. So an event of this type, not necessarily a surprise, but the impact um, that it's having now is have short decision making time, especially around some of the early phases, and I'm going to come to phases in a minute. And it is indeed a high impact and existential threat. I think we can clearly see that where we are today. Many organizations, many companies um, will fail um, and will cease to exist. And that's, of course, extremely troubling uh, and worrying for, for people that, that are in that. And finally, that often there is not necessarily a rule book, an SOP, to tell us what to do. So, you know, where do we go to, to, to try to navigate the way through? So these are some of the key elements that constitute uh, a crisis. <clears throat> Let's look at it another way. Um, you know, when we look at the impact on the y-axis there and the time scale, well, you know, we can go up and down in our government or organization with things that go wrong, systems failures, uh, staff unhappiness, maybe a crisis, a lost USB key, and these we can deal with because we have, um, we have uh, processes in place to deal with that. It can get a little bit worse. We could have a fire. Uh, we could have somebody who um, gets ill. Um, we could have somebody who's maybe even kidnapped but we can put into place emergency procedures. When we move into a crisis, then the impact is far greater. Now, I think we can pretty much understand all of that. And there are some really good guidance, international standards, ISOs, uh, to help us do that. So we have uh, risk management, risk and trust are the central tenants around effective crisis management. Um, we can have business continuity plans. I guess a lot of the people on this call will be have uh, uh, business continuity plans in place. 
we can have emergency procedures, including legislation, lockdown procedures, and so forth. When we come to crisis management, um, the one thing that we know in the, in the work that we've been doing here at GCSP is really the very important role that leadership takes. So very often, you perhaps don't need very massive effective leadership in some of these uh, 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 lower phases. Um, but when we come to a crisis, we do. Um, now, <clears throat> depending on who you are, uh, I think it's very important to understand the tolerance. So a very uh, uh, a company or organization like the WHO, like the ICRC, and like uh, crisis functions in governments can have a pretty good tolerance level. They know where they are in this heat map. Other organizations or individuals may have a, a lower or indeed a higher uh, understanding uh, of where their tolerance is. So it is not necessarily the same picture for everybody. Uh, so fire brigades, military can often have a very strong tolerance level and small organizations, small companies can have a much lower tolerance for the same series of events. And that means that you need to apply different systems and procedures uh, around your own tolerance level. Now, um, when an, uh, uh, an incident happens, a disruptive incident happens, well, you know, we move into respond phase. Uh, then uh, if it doesn't go away very, very, very quickly, we move into crisis management and then into business continuity and then into a recovery phase. These are the very standard procedures um, around uh, uh, managing a critical incident or a crisis. <clears throat> What is often forgotten is the, uh, the work in the preparedness phase that needs to happen. And I think this in many ways is why we are in, in COVID today, uh, why we are where we are, because some of these preparatory phases have not been either done or not been done well enough and applied. Um, <clears throat> so whether it's the risk analysis or doing implementation and training, um, audits and reviews and developing and maintaining systems. So why I say it wasn't a black swan incident is, well, so many governments have expected a pandemic and they've even gone and tested and exercises, but they have not necessarily then invested in assure, assuring, for example, adequate uh, uh, testing, adequate uh, PPE and, and so forth. And that's why uh, in, uh, in many incidences, we are in the situation where we are today. But let's just, um, let's just, you know, specifically around COVID, let's just look at the different phases and what they mean. Uh, generally, we can talk about there being uh, three phases, the, the alert and containment phase, the response phase, and the recovery phase. Uh, now, you know, again, around this call, I see there are people from many different countries. Um, some countries are in, perhaps in P3, we can think perhaps around um, South Korea, Japan, uh, moving into the recovery phase. Um, others are in, still in the uh, response phase, um, coming out of uh, lockdown. And others may still be in phase one, uh, where they are still trying to get a grasp of the situation uh, as to where they are. Um, and I think we can see this happening now in Latin America. We can see also a lot of concerns expressed around the African continent and so forth. So you may be in one of these phases as an organization or as a country, but that doesn't necessarily mean that every country is in the same phase or every organization is the same phase as you. Now let's look in, 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 in phase one. Um, which I schematically put, put up as like four weeks, um, but it could be longer. And let's just remember that four weeks in crisis is a long time. Um, anybody who's been in a major crisis will know that after three or four days, you're exhausted um, because you're dealing with a lot of different issues, trying to do sense making, looking at response, staff welfare and so forth. So thinking about four weeks, well, that's, that's pretty tough. So the, the priorities in an emergency phase, in the alert containment phase, the P1, 
staff welfare, safety, um, putting in your immediate business continuity plan. So keeping your business or your organization going. And in the case of COVID, well, you know, what is the government telling us to do? So shutting down travel, shutting down airports, uh, borders, and then assuring your organization, your staff then are applying, uh, uh, you're complying to those uh, uh, regulations. <clears throat> in terms of methods, well, we have crisis management teams and I hope a lot of you um, have crisis management teams and a lot of you may be in crisis management teams. Those get mobilized, people start working together, uh, working 24 hours a day in this emergency phase, putting in the business continuity plans, switching from you know talking to people and meeting people to doing things um, virtually, which has been the major issue around this, uh, this crisis. And then trying to evaluate the scenarios that are going to unfold, unfold in front of you. It's part of the task of the, uh, of the crisis management team. There will then be triggers that will move you into the response phase. Now, those may, those may be internal ones. Um, those may be external ones uh, issued by, by the government. But try to identify those triggers that moves you into the second phase uh, are important. Um, so, for example, e easing of lockdown procedures, um, um, data coming in, trying to gather data uh, uh, around, for example, uh, infection, doing your risk assessment. And that tri those triggers are really around what is the acceptable risk from you to move from one phase to another phase. And in phase two, uh, the priorities, and I've just done a couple in each one, three examples, there may of course be a lot more. Uh, you now need to start supporting your staff because those who've been busy in phase one uh, will be tired. We'll start making um, decisions that may be not optimum because they're tired and stressed and worried. And often they're very worried about their family as well as their own business. Start to be identifying strategic objectives. Where do we want to do? What's our priorities right now? We're not in a business as usual situation. So what are our priorities? And then how are decisions being made? Who's making the decisions? Very often phase one is, is an assertive top-down approach. As we move across the other phases, and uh, both Peter and Patrick will be talking about this later, um, there may be different types and ways of making um, decisions in these phases. We have then different methods to help us navigate our way through, the, uh, way through this phase. Um, forward thinking cell, I'm just going to touch on that in a, in a few minutes. Um, and then taking um, uh, subgroups in crisis management, bringing in people with knowledge and expertise who may not have been involved in phase one. So it may be security, it may be system support, it may be staff welfare, it may be communications. So, so to be having subgroups within your crisis management team with the needed expertise and knowledge around that. And indeed, bringing in those staff who may not have been engaged um, as a support and surge mechanism to, uh, to your crisis management. Again, we then have triggers moving us into the third phase, into the recovery phase. And again, schematically, I've said this could be, in, in the case of COVID, around uh, uh, five to eight weeks. Um, and then we uh, look at triggers again. But it, this is about acceptable risk. So are we now out of the uh, response phase and we can start thinking about recovery? So this looks at our adaptation of su supply chain, for example. Have we got the stuff that we need to run our business um, or have we have to rethink it? This is going on a lot in the world at the moment. Um, <clears throat> so instead of just being tactical um, and operational, we need to start thinking about uh, strategic. That's reorientating the business, reorientating the way that we work. And many people will tell you that crisis can be also an opportunity, an opportunity of rethinking how we work. And this may express itself through markets and growth opportunities. Um, there are, again, methods around that, uh, internal and external uh, learning. So how have we done? As an, as, an, as an organization? And what are others around us in a similar situation doing? Governments are doing this a lot at the moment. 
irrespective of the fact that almost every government in the world is doing something different. They are still trying to learn from what others are doing. Um, <clears throat> building enhanced resilience. Um, this is important because you will be um, changing the way that you work and something else can go wrong, especially in the situation where we are now, where the end state, be it a vaccine, um, is a long way away. So we know that we're going to have to build our resilience to, to, to manage our way through to that, um, that end state. And in terms of communication, often a lot of the communication in phase one and phase two will have been internal, keeping staff informed, building trust. Uh, and in the recovery phase, you need to start talking more to your external stakeholders. This is what we've faced, this is what we've done, this is what we're going to do. Um, so having a, a, a continuous approach to around how you're communicating internally. So very briefly, um, that's how I see the phases. And, and I think um, you should be thinking where, where are you as an organization or indeed as an individual in these phases? And do you know which phase you're in? Have you identified those, um, those triggers? And perhaps I'd ask people on this call to, to have a reflection. Do I really know where I am? Have I identified those triggers? Have I looked at some of these priorities and methods? And just turning to methods, finally, <clears throat> I mentioned here a forward thinking cell. I'm a great, I'm a great supporter of a forward thinking cell in very complex emergencies. Um, what do I mean by a forward thinking cell? Well, you know, if we look at uh, again, we keep impact and our time scales. Uh, we are <clears throat> in an emergency. We've seen lots and lots of curves in the news, uh, epidemiological curves. Um, and again, depending on where you are and who you are, um, you may uh, understand where you are in that curve. And with something like COVID, we need to be thinking, okay, what if it gets worse? What if something else comes along that I hadn't expected? What if we get a massive disruption to our IT systems, which has been sustaining our business? What if we get an earthquake on top of COVID? I have faced that several times. Something comes out of the blue. What if our recovery um, just continues in, uh, uh, and um, doesn't happen in the way that we had predicted. And I think a lot of, faith, a lot of governments are facing this now, um, that it just continues in the same manner. Uh, uh, and how sustainable is that? So a forward thinking cell is a specific cell within a crisis management team that is looking at these alternatives, picking up the weak signals, not necessarily doing the firefighting that has been happening in phase one and indeed sometimes phase two, but really thinking forward, learning from others, trying to identify the weak signals, trying to address the priorities against these four possible tangents from where we are. So um, I, I'm going to hand, those are just some thoughts from my side around uh, the crisis management phases. I'm going to hand over to Ingrid to see if there are any questions because I can't see. And um, and then uh, uh, Ingrid will hand over to, to, to Peter. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks, David. So we have a couple of questions. Um, the first one will be, what do you think about the contribution of, of foresight as a proactive attitude to better manage uh, further crisis, especially for the response phase? Yeah. I mean, I think I think that strategic foresight tools are, are, are very, very, very useful. Um, in the phase, in the first phase, you should be thinking around those uh, scenarios. Uh, remember, I talked about scenarios of development. Try to identify, um, you know, what our immediate objectives are. But I think foresight tools are really powerful in that forward-thinking cell that I mentioned right at the end, and to have various foresight tools and, and there are many and GCSP does a lot of work on foresight tools um, uh, are very useful. However, what I would suggest is that um, <clears throat> those foresight tools should be um, really uh, uh, contained within that forward thinking cell, applying those tools to learn from previous um, uh, experiences. I remember H1N1 
um, in 2009 when I was in the ICRC. And this didn't turn out quite the way that it was expected. But SARS, remember, is far more infectious in terms of, sorry, it's far more deadly than what we have now. But what we're facing now with COVID is the rate of infection is much more strong. So foresight tools and learning um, from past experiences can be very uh, can be very helpful in that respect. Thanks, David. Um, I have another one. Um, so we are always restricted by time during a crisis. How do we solve the, this time restriction, if possible? Yeah, well, I think it's partly about um, trying to adapt that phased approach to, to identify, you know, what do I need to do in terms of firefighting? We're, we're battling always with um, volatility or vulnerability. So what's the most vulnerable? What, what's the most at risk now? Um, in the case of COVID, we can see that, you know, the, the elderly citizens, uh, people, uh, people in hospital are the most vulnerable. So that's part of your risk analysis process. So saying, what do we need to address first? It's part of the vulnerability within the timescales that you've got. So again, I think it's, it's a question of coming back to, to, to risk. Um, so who are the people most at risk? What is the risk to my organization? And addressing those issues. What can I do now? May not be able, we know there's no vaccine right now. So, you know, the different measures and prevention methods, uh, that is put in around those vulnerabilities are very important. When you're also trying to look at uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity, the famous VUCA part of, of crisis management, um, you can try to see, you know, well, when might I be able to sense make? Um, when, and what by I mean sense making, it is around, can I start to get a picture? This is what we mean by sense making. Can I start to see, if you imagine a fuzzy image, when, when the pieces come into focus? And that's also a, a very helpful part. And this is really um, how the crisis management team should work. And finally, I'll just say one thing, which is around uh, speed of decision making. And that will be different in each of those phases. In phase one, you will need to make some fast decisions and live with those decisions. They may not be perfect, and, you know, crisis management is not about perfection. You will never get perfection. Um, and I think you need to accept that. Um, <clears throat> so I think also about this, how you make decisions, the speed you make decisions, the type of decision making in different phases is important. So uh, if there's no other questions, uh, Ingrid, and, and people may have questions that emerge of thinking about, thinking about where they are in the phases and following on from Peter's, um, we can try and deal with those at the end. Great, we will do that. Thanks, David. Peter, we see your presenter view. Wonderful. Can you hear me? Yes. We also see uh, your notes. So you want you might want to uh, hang on hear in a different way. I see what you mean. Just give me one moment. Thanks. Wonderful. So we're all adapting uh, uh, to this uh, uh, to this new environment. Um, so uh, I guess what I'd like to do in in this third part uh, is to to focus a little bit on on some of the things that David and um, Patrick have lifted up, um, and um, look a little bit at some of the practice practices around this. You know, what can we share? That, that you can take away, as I said at the beginning, you know, our aim is that you leave this session with something that you can put into, into practice. Um, you know, what I'd say is that we heard from, uh, we heard from David the importance of leadership in, in a crisis context. Uh, you have the systems and processes potentially that, that get you through uh, uh, many things, but, but leadership in, 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 in these kind of situations, um, the, the, the thoughts and actions of people in positions of authority have a huge impact on the system. So we've heard that we've heard about that. We've also heard um, that normative responses don't necessarily uh, make uh, for uh, or are adequate right now. So um, you combine those with what Patrick said right at the beginning, which is there is a legacy implication here, which, which is some of the decisions we make and some of the ways that we act. Uh, uh, right now and in the coming months 
are going to have a legacy impact on our organization, uh, also beyond our organization, on our beneficiaries, on our, on our funders. Um, you know, everything is very visible these days. So um, that cuts a bit of, put, puts a bit of pressure, uh, I think, if you, if you sum it up in that way, that, that, that there's a lot of expectation. So, so what to do about that? And, 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 and how, can you, uh, um, how can you navigate some of those pressures? Um, what are some of the mindsets and practices that are, are useful? Uh, and we share these um, from our experience, uh, um, as you've heard already uh, for many years, but particularly in the last five or six years, working with emergency response organizations uh, um, and how they have learned to, and how we've also helped them from a leadership point of view, continue to learn to develop how to navigate uh, really challenging conditions. Um, so let me start by um, giving you a, a slightly different way of thinking about leadership. Right? We talk a lot about leadership is about characteristics and practices and, 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 and behaviors, et cetera. Um, but another way to think about it is that it's a social process. Right? It happens, it's something that happens between people. Um, and you think, if you think about it that way, uh, um, and, and CCL did some, some research, in fact, that showed that, that produces three distinct outcomes. Um, it produces a certain amount of direction. In other words, how clear and accepted is the way forward? It produces a certain amount of alignment. How well is our work coordinated? It produces a certain amount of commitment. Um, how much are people willing to prioritize our collective success? So there's a framework we can begin to think about unpacking this. Um, now, if we take that to, to where we are today, uh, I, I really want to highlight, and these four things have been highlighted already, four things that, that, that really stand out as being important and requiring attention, um, continued attention. And just to add uh, to some of the things that David and Patrick have lifted up, I, I, I would say a few more things about terms of where we are right now. Um, because a lot of us are being thrown new challenges. Um, new things to deal with. Um, but what we're also seeing is an amplification of some existing challenges, existing tensions in our organizations, things that weren't perfect already, and nowhere's perfect, uh, uh, as David said, um, are being amplified right now. Bottlenecks. You know, what works well in terms of how we make decisions, how we work together. Um, so we've got this amplification of existing uh, uh, things that weren't perfect. Um, We've got new challenges coming together. The other thing to, to, to emphasize, I think, right now is when people collectively, and I'm talking now at a, at a, at a, at a government level, at a governance level, um, uh, when there is a, a situation like this, people are looking for direction, for protection, and for order. So if we look at certain governments, certain individuals, certain leaders uh, uh, um, that are being put forward right now, uh, um, and you see this a lot on social media, as being examples of, of navigating this, this, this COVID-19 crisis well so far, what you'll probably see is that they are addressing those three areas and speaking to those three areas in ways that are accessible to their public. So they're um, providing a sense of direction, they're providing a sense of protection, and they're providing a sense of order appropriate to you know, the way that country would like to see those things happen. So that's also something to think about in our own organizations. Um, we're seeing a, a, an increased uh, um, expression of, of um, the, the very human responses to this, this kind of situation and the pressures that it, it creates on all of us. We're seeing increases in domestic violence. We're seeing public figures um, again, um, fall foul to not being able to manage their hungers. Um, and we see a need for, for, for some very human um, behaviors. Uh, uh, um, and we see people in positions of authority maybe letting themselves down at the moment. Um, and we do need to pay attention to that. Um, uh, and back to Patrick's point earlier, the decisions we're making now uh, uh, um, are going to carry weight, not just right now, but going forward. So what to do about that? Well, these four areas of trust, risk, resilience, and learning um, can really, I think, help us um, address uh, and navigate to the best of our ability some of those issues. So what do we mean by trust right now? 
trust is a, is, a, is a very big topic to unpack in a short webinar, but, but right now we're probably talking about, you know, to what extent and how are formal authority figures, leaders in our organizations or our, our countries expressing concern for, for, our, for my well-being, for your well-being, um, concern for their well-being of the organization we, we both work for or represent and concern for their own well-being or self-interest. Um, how is that coming out? How is that coming across? Um, heard some examples already of, of, of uh, um, this, you know, people inadvertently making comments um, at a time when we're all quite tired, right? We've been eight, nearly 10 weeks into, into this journey right now. It's easy to let things slip out. Um, and in a virtual world, you know, trust becomes more difficult because we don't have the kind of access, we're not getting the kind of data that we maybe normally have access to. So a couple of quick practices. Um, restating and resharing priorities. Patrick talked about um, uh, short-term, mid-term and long-term priority setting. Um, you, you've probably been sharing short-term priorities regularly uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, are you starting to share and give some insights into, into where you are in, in terms of thinking of mid-term priorities, what's coming next for the rest of the year? And in addition to that, are you able to share and are you giving some guiding principles for how you're setting those priorities? To give you an example, here at GCSP, we, we, we did something very early um, and management team doing something really early here, which was to say we have three guiding principles that are gonna take us through this. Uh, um, one is staff and participant safety comes first. Two is how do we resume value added activity? And three is how do we be a responsible actor at this time? when it comes to um, social distancing and other practices that are intended to reduce infection. So setting those and restating those guiding principles give people an anchor, they give something to hook onto. Um, when to change uh, aware decisions can be made. David talked about this. So in, in, a, in the early days of this crisis response, it probably felt the right thing to do to centralize a lot of decision making. Um, are you able to let that go again? Are you able to give decisions out to where they can be made um, to see more people contribute more? Um, if you're in a position of authority, do you know what you personally are most afraid of and, and how are you letting that slip out? Um, possibly unintentionally at times. And the last thing on, on trust is uh, it's not a static thing. It's a moving feast trust. It's either increasing or decreasing, eroding. So are you able to judge whether trust in your organization is on the increase or on the decrease? So I wanna move on to the second one around resilience. Um, I would say that this is uh, so important in fact right now that we're actually doing a second webinar specifically on this topic next week. Um, so I would encourage you to join us as we really uh, spend some quality time understanding what we can do about this. Um, um, but, but a mantra that works for, for me right now is, is this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. And if you try um, getting through this at sprinting pace, um, you're going to end up uh, uh, suffering uh, some, uh, um, <laughs> some injury or some, some, some burnouts uh, um, along the way. It's going to cost. Um, what can you do about this? Well, on a personal level, have you got the right kind of anchors? You know, as, as, as individuals, particularly if you're in a position of authority and you're, you're highly visible and a lot of people are looking to you, do you have um, uh, sanctuaries? Do you have physical places that you can go to that, that, that help you re-energize? Um, do you have some practices? And I'm talking about mind and spirit here, uh, sporting practices, uh, routines that help you switch on, switch off, Right now, we're hearing a lot of people are, are um, uh, finding it difficult to create boundaries between work and home because for a lot of people, there is a blurring that is not normal. Um, so what are some of the practices you can set around that? And, and particularly in positions of authority, do you have confidants? Do you have speaker that you, people that you can speak to openly and honestly about what's going on for you? Uh, and I don't mean people within your organization, I mean people who are not connected um, to your you know, area of responsibility or influence, where you can truly open up and, and have, a, have a genuine, meaningful conversation. 
Um, these things, uh, for some, these are obvious. For others, these are less, uh, uh, less obvious and less practiced, but they do make a difference. Um, another thing that, that we're seeing is, is um, as we less have less visibility and access to people, um, um, in, you know, we can worry about, you know, is everybody really contributing? Are people taking advantage of this situation? Are they actually working? I can't see, I can't go around, I can't, and we're not in the same building together. Um, some of the early research shows that you need to switch that thinking and worry more about the opposite. Right? Of course, there will always be individuals that maybe uh, uh, um, uh, aren't as, as, as present and engaged as you would like them to be. But you, across the organization, across your team, you probably need to worry more about burnout than you do uh, not contributing enough. Um, certainly, the signals that we're getting from, from our own organization, from who we're working with, show that um, it's more about an issue of helping people not overcommit. Right now, if you think about it, uh, if you're worried about your, your role, your job security, uh, you often um, do more to, to make yourself visible, to, to make it known that you're contributing. Um, and so you often see people uh, uh, responding to that. And, and because we're all virtual and remote from each other, um, you're probably more likely to see people trying harder to be busy and visible uh, than less harder. Uh, um, so just you know, know where you are in, in that. And as I said before, this is such an important topic. There is so much more to share about this that we have a, a webinar with Fleur Hayworth and, and, and Patrick Sweet on this call also uh, on the 3rd of June, where we're going to really delve into this subject and, 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 and uh, help uh, figure out what are some uh, meaningful ways to, to build some resilience uh, um, for us as individuals, but also collective resilience. Uh, third one around risk. Um, the extent to which people are willing to say or do what your organization really needs them to say or do right now. All right. Um, you're probably asking your, 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 yourself at the moment, you know, to what extent are we going to have to adapt? There was a question earlier about mission uh, uh, um, and, and whether that needs to change and, and how we get there. Uh, and that's, 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 that, I think that speaks to where our attention is right now, is which, which is, does this mean we'll be able to continue to do what we do in the way we do it? Or does this mean we will need to adapt that? Um, uh, and to what extent? Uh, and, and how successfully you are, you are in that will probably be partly determined by the culture of risk in your organization. Um, now, that might be uh, uh, to your advantage or, or to your disadvantage. It depends on, on, on what that culture is. Um, but there are some things to, to, to take away that you can, uh, I think, uh, fairly quickly um, reflect on or put into practice, which is where are you experimenting? You should be experimenting right now. It can be small pockets. It can be, can be, can be little experiments. But where are you experimenting? Um, and how are you learning from those experiments? In other words, how are you picking up signals for um, both new practices, but also in terms of what you're currently doing? What are the indicators? What is the feedback loop in your organization, in your team right now, that tells you you're doing enough of the right things? And once you are clearer on the answer to that, um, is that giving you early enough indicators? Do you need to go out and seek uh, uh, input or data? Um, and that can be picking up the phone and calling a, a beneficiary or, 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 or a, a contributor, a funder, or a, a particular stakeholder. It can be more, more quantitative. But are you getting early enough data to tell you that what you're doing is getting you what you need? So um, you can always ask yourself, is there an earlier way to get what we need to know? Than what we're getting now. The second part to this really is about psychological safety. Um, how much personal risk is involved in speaking up in your organization? If I'm seeing something um, that I think is really important that we at GCSP need to, to know about, because it, it affects how we do our work, then um, how safe is it for me to speak up and, and say that? Uh, how, 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 is that, how is that rewarded or, 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 or not rewarded? Uh, uh, and what is going to make me um, 
and go beyond just recognizing it to flag that. Um, and part of that is also, uh, if you're going to ask people to experiment, is also recognizing that at some, they're, they're going to make mistakes along the way. They're going to be lessons to be learned. So when someone does get it wrong, how are you going to respond? Because everybody will be watching. Uh, and if you respond in a way that doesn't encourage continued experimentation, uh, um, that, that, that very quickly starts to get reduced. Um, I want to move on to, 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 to um, this, this idea of learning. I think a lot of people are saying, oh, what can we learn from this, from this situation? And, and of course, um, uh, 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 probably plenty. Uh, and we're all quite tired right now. Uh, and, and we could all probably do with a bit of a, a, bit of a break because this might be a, a journey that goes on for a, for a little while longer. Um, that said, uh, I was listening to an interview um, uh, with, prior to COVID actually, with, with um, as you can imagine, I'm rather preoccupied with, with Brexit, was the crisis that my country, uh, the UK, was dealing with prior to and is still uh, during uh, COVID, unfortunately. Um, but I was listening to an interview with the head of a major supermarket chain. Uh, and the interviewer asked this person, how are you coping with this major disruption to your business? Um, and, and the question was asked, clearly expecting the response to be about all the challenges and problems that, that, that this, this was presenting um, that, that organization with. And yet the response they got was, the person basically said, look, what we don't realize is this is an opportunity for the UK to think about future food security for the next 50 years, sustainable uh, and safe ways to produce, manufacture, and, 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 and manage our, our supply system. This is, this is an opportunity. We're being forced to rethink this now. So it was just to say that this person had a way of thinking that, that went, do you know what? This is an opportunity. We need to see it and approach it in this way. So I think that first and foremost, um, the, the, the ability and willingness, uh, willingness speaks volumes here, I think, to learn from experience and to apply that learning to perform successfully into you know, situations that are yet to happen. Um, so that speaks, so I think, to, to your own mindset. To what extent do you think that you have things to learn? Um, I mean, you know, the, the, the learning that's on offer, I think, is, is, is very much linked to how open we are to it uh, in the first place. Um, and to what extent uh, are we giving the permission and space to people in our organization to step back, think and learn from what they're doing? And one other thing I would like to add to this, particularly if you, as you develop and you gain experience and, and, and through your life and, and, and your career, um, there are always things to learn, but there are also sometimes things to let go of. So this idea of unlearning. Um, so you might also want to be thinking about, you know, are there things that I or we um, actually need to let go of um, because they're no longer serving us? They're no longer getting us what we need. If you think about people going through their career as you go from one level to a next in seniority, what works to get you here might not get you there. And I think the same applies in this context as we go through this, 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 this protracted crisis is um, what got us through phase one may not be the same practices that get us through phase two. Useful question here to think about um, is what can you or your organization do now that you couldn't or wouldn't do two months ago? Um, and just, just uh, following on from that learning frame, is it, it, you can think about it at an individual level, but it is also a collective. This also works at the collective level. There are, there are a number of biases uh, that uh, really will inform um, how we think and what we, what we can gain from, from uh, um, what we're forced to be exposed to and experience right now. And um, David talked about the forward cell and the importance of forward thinking. Uh, I would add to that that it's also about looking up and looking outward. It can be very tempting to be focused on um, the, the immediate uh, and the internal uh, to the extent that that's um, uh, be, be, because of time pressure, because we're under so much pressure to 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 address so many different areas. But who, if not yourself, who is looking upwards? Who is looking outwards um, to see what others are doing? 
um, to, to overcome some of those biases that you see listed on the slide. Um, and when it comes to the second one, uh, some of the tensions uh, that need to be navigated, that we recognize are recurring, uh, and this wheel has, has come out of the, the work that David and Patrick and myself have been doing over the last two, three years around um, what are some of the practices in, in, in crisis response that um, make a difference? Well, you'll see them on this wheel portrayed as sort of either or. You know, is it, is it either short-term thinking or long-term thinking? Well, we would all recognize it's probably about doing both. But how well do you bow both? And it applies to each of those tensions that you see on that wheel. And the, your ability to judge where you need to attend to um, will have an impact on, on risk taking. It'll have an impact on trust. And then lastly, uh, as we um, think about transforming uh, beyond sort of the medium and the long-term implications, knowing full well that, that, you know, the phase we're in now, you know, this may be a linear journey, but it may not. This, this may loop back again. Uh, so we need to recognize that. But, you know, there is, it is important to reflect on how your urgent crisis response practices um, if continued into the phase we're going into now, if you continue with the same practices, there is a risk that they have, um, they build up some, some, some negative uh, um, uh, impact on, on, on the rest of the organization. Um, so if you take the top example, um, centralized decision making, as we talked about, you know, over time, if you're not able to free that up again and place decision making back where it needs to be, um, then, then that's going to really reinforce a, a hierarchical structure of let's sit and wait until we're told what to do. Um, whereas now you might want to be looking to decentralize some of that so people are allowed and given permission to experiment to the extent that that's you know, appropriate and possible. Um, because that's going to give more people in your organization more opportunity to contribute uh, uh, and you'll be able to draw on more of the intelligence that you have uh, in terms of shaping what that long-term future looks like. So there are many different levels of that, um, but essentially, just know that as the as the as the as the as the phase changes, so does your practices and the need to recognise what is working for you now and when that needs to be adapted. So I'll finish my piece with uh, some so, some wise words that um, uh, were shared uh, um, recently by a. Uh, an organization that we've done a lot of work with, Patrick Street particularly, has is, is, is spent a lot of time in the last couple of years working and collaborating with Global Fund. And Patrick Nicolier is the head of human resources at the Global Fund. And, and he shared this pearl of wisdom that I, I would like to leave you with because I think it, 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 um, it's just a wonderful, uh, concise way of some really important things, which is keep your head cool, keep your heart warm, and keep your hands clean. And with that, Ingrid, I hand back to you. Thanks, Peter. There are a couple of questions. Uh, so the first one is from Brenda. Um, she's wondering, what's your advice when a crisis hits and your organization has the prone leadership to deal with it? When the crisis hits and your organization has the wrong leadership. Um, yeah, there's a thing, Brenda. Um, I think that, uh, uh, um, David said something earlier, which is there is no such thing as a perfect in, in crisis management. Um, and the reality is that um, you have the leadership you have right now to the extent that you're able to influence that. I mean, if you're in a position where you have the authority to influence that, uh, uh, who is, it, who is, who is uh, involved in, in um, decision making, then, then there is space for you to act. If you're not in that situation, which is for many of us, um, then that can be uh, hugely frustrating um, and debilitating. Um, and back to the legacy point, that, that can have a lasting damage to the organization's success in the future. So if you can't change it, then you have to acknowledge and recognize that you can't change that. Uh, 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 and that you uh, do need to really focus on where you can make a difference in that system. Now, the answer to that it will be different to everybody, but, but 
um, that there is going to be, I suspect, for many of us, a need to build some tolerance and, and, and resilience to um, being part of, of, of a system and organization that, that isn't perfect uh, and the consequences of that and the extent to which you have a tolerance um, to continue to support that and, and do the best that you can uh, um, in the way that you, you, you see fit. Uh, so it's, it, it, it be clear about what your expectations are for yourself and those around you. Because there are some things that you can influence and there are probably some things that you can't. That's probably where I'd um, suggest uh, um, recognizing that, that, that this is probably a very difficult context. I, I'd like to add something there, Peter, if I could. Um, it, it might be uh, <clears throat> that you are focusing on a particular level of concerns and the leadership that you're pointing to might be focusing on a completely different level and it mm. feel wrong. Um, or they might be looking at a different time frame. It may be the wrong time frame. I'm not suggesting that you're wrong. I'm suggesting that um, uh, one thing you can, I think, take away from this uh, session is look at the phases and look at the timing and listen to what they're talking to. And maybe what feels wrong is just that they're attending to something different than you are. Um, and try to get your head there. It still may be wrong. They may be attending to it poorly. Uh, so I'm not suggesting that, you know, it's always, uh, somebody else is always right. But, but think, about the, think about the timing and the framing of what they're saying. And you, you might see that they're actually just attending to something different. And you might want to then approach them and say, I think we need to attend to a different thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks, I might add, <clears throat> uh, from, from my side to Brenda's question, I mean, um, it's a really difficult one because if you have the wrong leadership in crisis, if you look at the data, you look at some of the facts that has come out from the commercial world, um, the risks are that you're gonna fail. The failure rate, for companies um, in a crisis, not an emergency, but in a crisis, uh, is around 40%. And so that's pretty serious. Uh, now, that's not necessarily the same situation across governments, but uh, you know, if you are facing that situation, um, you're going to have a problem. That's why we encourage leaders um, and uh, leaders in organizations to, to do more training. Uh, to understand uh, the issues about the phases, to understand the issues related to different styles of uh, uh, decision making in the different phases. So to enhance the awareness, I go back to all I was talking about in the preparedness phase, but it's a, it's a pretty situation if you feel um, that the leadership is failing uh, in a crisis. But I think it's very true what uh, Peter and Patrick said, that the perception of is it right or is it wrong may be different to your own perception. Thanks, David. So with that note, and I'm aware that there are some other um, questions in the chat, uh, but the time is a bit pressing. So I would like to move on to the summary and takeaways from, from the webinar. Thank you everybody for your participation and, and for the presenters and experts. We can see, thanks. <laughs> Uh, let me try to fix this. We are still learning, as you can see. Um, so. It's good now. Mm -hmm. Do you still see my presenter view? Nope, looks yeah. good. Oh, good? Sorry. Yes, you do. Great. Uh, it looks good or you see my presenter view? See the presenter view. Okay, Peter, can I ask you to present for me? Yes. Do you mind? Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for that. Yep. Um, we, we just wanted to walk you through the highlights and key takeaways from the webinar. 
so that you can bring something back home, something concrete. Um, so definitely the impact of COVID-19 comes uh, as a surprise. We were not necessarily ready uh, and adapting and being fl flexible is, is absolutely required right now. Um, there is also a new normal that is, we learned that is transformational. There are possibilities to, to have a new, more uh, vulnerable ourselves, a new me, uh, and also a better me with, with more strengths. Um, also bearing in mind that um, crisis can be an opportunity. Uh, this can be our, our opportunity to learn uh, new practices, but also to unlearn certain old practices that are not useful anymore. Um, and also uh, for, for entities and organizations to start thinking and rethinking their own systems and processes that might not be useful anymore. Um, some things that were working in the past might not be working today. Um, so uh, it, the, there is a reflection needed for, for all of us. And as Peter said, this is not a marathon. Uh, this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Uh, and there is the need for, for our own resilience and um, mindfulness to find the right anchors. Uh, so having, having people that we can share uh, honestly and building certain routines that, that help us go through, through these times. Um, with that, I would like to go uh, to the next slide because there are still different ways that GCSP and the Alliance um, that we believe we can support. The first one uh, will be the resilient webinar that Peter mentioned. This is gonna happen on the 3rd of June and you will be able to subscribe and, from the website. I believe the applications are already open, so we encourage you to, to join us for that conversation. Um, we are currently having a fully online Lead and Influence with Impact course, and we plan to have a second edition this year uh, in September. So we also encourage you to have it in the radar because definitely um, there will be tools and uh, practices that might be, might be useful for you to learn. Um, and then there will be also this uh, crisis management navigating the storm course that has been adapted to be fully online with two parts in June and October. So that's also coming. And to end, we will also have the promotion on the ISRM online co conference that will be happening in July. So we encourage you to keep browsing the website and to join the newsletter if you didn't. Uh, to be able to actually get the best from all, our, all the activities that we are promoting. So I would just like to turn it back to you. We have nine minutes uh, to try to understand what's your experience right now. Um, so we encourage you to use the chat to post your questions or to raise your hand so that we can uh, give you a space for you to talk. Thank you. I see that we have some questions. Uh, thanks for the link, Renzo. Renzo has shared the link uh, to uh, subscribe yourself to some of the courses. Uh, I see Mohammed is raising his hand. Yeah. Do you have a question, Mohammed? You are on mute. I'm not sure if Mohammed can hear us. Thank you very much, Andre. Oh, okay. uh, thank you for uh, your uh, amazing presentation, uh, Peter. And uh, my question is about that um, uh, coronavirus showed that uh, there is an actual crisis in the leadership. In your opinion, is there uh, is there is a moment that uh, should we rethink about the fixed and static concepts about the leadership? at least because it proves its failure, in my opinion. It is not a linear implementation for static uh, terminologies, in my opinion. Uh, thank you very much. I think that was you, Peter. I can have a, I, I, could, I mean, <laughs> there's, a, there's a big question. Um, you know, uh, we use the word leadership lazily in the English language. Uh, so I'll speak to that first. You know, sometimes we say leadership, we're talking about the, the leadership of a country or of an organization, the, the, a cadre of people that have power and authority. Sometimes we're talking about um, 
uh, we used in, we used the word leadership and, and we're referring to um, uh, certain roles in organization and sometimes we, we use it and we're talking about practices and ways of thinking and acting that anyone uh, uh, um, can can do uh, regardless of whether they have a title or not and, and so so I, I guess what I heard in your question was a reference to the former of those three a little bit um, and, and I mean and that depends where you're sitting doesn't it depends who you ask uh, uh, um, I think uh, um, what we're certainly seeing is a, is a need for um, I'd use the three things earlier, protection, uh, direction, and order uh, in different countries that exp is expressed in different ways. Um, and the need for protection, direction, and order is being responded to in different ways by different governments. Uh, and, and we're seeing the consequences of those responses playing out in, in the media and, and some of them are being we're seeing more of than others So there are probably examples that, that are less visible to us that we should probably be looking at um, And we're all making up our own minds about that um, and part of that is cultural Because you know, we we have different expectations in different parts of the world part of that is value driven you know, we're seeing people do things that are consistent with our values and that are um, uh, strongly against our values. So we, we make our judgment based on that. Um, but, but we also, I guess, need to look at the, the implications uh, uh, and the, the consequences of the decisions being made in different countries right now. In Europe, for example, we, we, we're looking at um, lots of fairly small countries having very different approaches. Uh, um, at the same time and, and, and time will tell time will tell how those approaches uh, um, have um, uh, influenced uh, the the outcomes um, but but one thing's for sure the approaches are, are partly a technical response but they're also partly a response to the fact that different culture different countries have different um, had different needs you know Patrick talked earlier about Sweden's approach being quite different to here in Switzerland for example um, and um, uh, we're going to have to, the jury is out on the data at this stage. Um, but, but where the conversation therefore goes to is, you know, is this person showing the qualities that I value? And I will judge their leadership on that. And, and it, it is an important part of the story, but it's not the whole story. So, so I think that, that there is a, there's a bit of, t there's a time factor here that we need to take into account. Um, um, but the human value aspect of it is 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 where the conversation is right now, and that's that's understandable, but not necessarily always the full picture or entirely helpful. I don't know if my colleagues have anything to add to that. Thanks, Peter. There is another question from Jonathan. Uh, what man, what many people seem to want, and what leaders are offering, is denial and salvation. Any thoughts on that? Can you say that again? Denial and? Yes, salvation. Hmm. Well, that's a, um, <clears throat> I guess that's just a statement. It doesn't sound like a question. It's like what, what people are offering is denial and salvation. Um, I think the word salvation is interesting because I think it just accentuates the fact that it, it amplifies the acuteness of what we feel. Um, um, and if we don't speak to some of these really deep uh, security needs, these uh, needs for um, believing that we can move forward, and I think leaders have a particular responsibility to role model that, um, yeah, it, it, it disintegrates, it devolves um, into more and more fears. So I think that comment speaks directly to the idea that we need to build in wherever we can safety. And uh, how you do that is a lot of ways is in connectedness. It's not by dividing people. It's in encouragement. It's in inclusion. Um, and it's in transparency as much as possible. All of those are tensions. If you have to ask back, if you have to ask fa act fast, it's hard to be inclusive. It's hard to be totally transparent. And sometimes the phase, early phase, requires fast action. So I guess the idea is, is uh, speaking to that notion of safety. 
um, it really comes up. Thanks, Patrick. Um, there is another question linked to forward thinking. Um, so how much should be shared or made public by the organizations? And what's the right balance between secrecy and sharing information? I guess that's, that one is for you, David. Yeah, okay. Um, look, I mean, I, I think the, you know, the notion of a forward thinking cell is to try and, and, and look ahead in terms of those lines I mentioned. What if it gets worse? What if it continues as it is? What if something new happens? What if your recovery is not as, as, as anticipated? And that's, um, that's really the role of the forward thinking cell. Now, you know, in our crisis management courses, we go into depth in this, in, into this, you know, how a forward thinking cell can, can work. Um, but essentially what you're trying to do is to um, sense make, um, uh, you know, i.e. Uh, what, what can we learn from the past and where are we now? And then you're looking to sense break, which is to say what is relevant for us and what can we do or what can we actually control and what is out of our control? What's a generic issue, which may be out of our control and what's a specific issue? Um, and usually you should try to find three or four things which feeds into the strategic crisis management team. Um, and um, I think that the, you know, the role of forward thinking self is an is a, is a ad adult to the crisis management team. And usually it's around uh, you know, one or a group of people who um, are specifically looking ahead as opposed to, to dealing with the face-to-face -face issues. I'm putting those then back to um, the crisis management team. And it's not an easy task. I've done that several times and it's really not very easy, especially when you're dealing with so many unknowns and so many, uh, so many variables. But there is methodologies that can work to do that. And that's really around, I think that, you know, some of those trajectories, um, you know, things getting worse and so forth, will definitely be, be being considered by governments, uh, but it should feed into the overall strategic uh, uh, orientation. Um, you know, there may be certain in terms of uh, confidentiality and secrecy. Well, I think it depends very, very much on the context and the risks associated with transparency um, and or, um, uh, you know, a needs to know basis. It's not either one or the other. It's a kind of polarity or tension that we can often come across. How much do we share? How much are we tra transparent and open? Um, I just want to say a comment also around this kind of challenge that the leaders have now because and the issue of trust. Of course, you know, it's not easy task being a leader in these situations. We can all be very critical and I think we can find a lot of the leaders now currently relying on, you know, the science or the medical evidence. But what's very difficult is when that medical evidence is unknown or ambiguous in itself. And you may be getting contradictory or confusing, um, uncertain medical evidence um, around the particular COVID thing. So that that that's pretty difficult, um, and I wouldn't like necessarily to be in the shoes of some of uh, uh, some of these decision makers. But um, you know, it has to has to be done. And I think that uh, applying more rigorous crisis management methodologies would actually uh, aid that, especially with some of the tools that we've been, uh, that we've been mentioning. Thanks, David. Uh, the last question comes from Gada. Um, so how can we avoid going back to all familiar habits, especially in face of coming crises like climate change? Yeah, that's, 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 that's a great question. And it's, it's being, there's that opportunity mindset, right? Being talked, as I said earlier, in that example of that 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 supermarket boss, you know, is is um, how do we uh, we 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 are on this in this situation, uh, um, and the way forward um, we can allow to be um, positioned as um, challenges, or, or we, we can position this as as a a um, an opportunity to to shape. Um, uh, the way we approach our work and, and even our mission potentially, um, and and uh, it, that very much dependent, uh, for example, on things like the size of your organisation uh, and and the stakeholders. If you're a large UN agency uh, um, with 193 stakeholders, then 
um, the journey to change and, and adapt is very different to if you're a, a, a small organization with, with 12 people um, that can get together on a Zoom call and, and, and figure these things out. So that journey looks very different, um, but also the impact is very different, potentially. If, if, if you're a bigger system. So um, one thing you can do to, to speak to the question very concretely is recognize that not all continuity is bad and not all change is good and vice versa. Too much continuity might not be, uh, 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 might be very risky right now and uh, not enough change can mean you, you actually fall behind uh, and, and become irrelevant. Um, and that is back to some of those tensions we talked about earlier. How do you leverage that? Well, you set the mission that you have today up front um, and you look at the landscape and how that's changing um, and you start to look at what are the advantages of what you have today and what are the, what are the advantages of, of uh, um, what you need to change. Um, and so you, you kind of start to map it out um, because Continuity will have some, 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 some potential advantages in moving you forward. There are some practices you probably want to keep, um, but it can have some disadvantages if you don't change anything, and conversely. So maybe look at the upsides of, of, of what you have and the downsides, and also the upsides of what you'd like to change in the downsides. I'd like to add that, that you're introducing something um, in the question around, say, climate change. And what um, I think Peter's driving at, and at least what it brings up for me personally, is um, how have my priorities changed because of this? That's kind of what Peter's saying. Have my so is climate change something now that is much more of a priority because I'm much more aware of things that are sleeping on the outside that can be crisis directed. And if I, if I have new priorities, then the next question is, are there uh, things that have changed that challenge my assumptions? I'll give you an example. I think prior to COVID, the ability for leadership in teams to look at each other or look at uh, people who report into them and say, do you really, really have to have that face-to-face -face meeting? Can't you do that via Zoom? Prior to COVID, there wasn't the infrastructure of competence and shared experience of clients and everybody else. So taking the risk of saying, no, we're not going to run this, this get to know meeting on, on Zoom because we really need to be there. That's all the way we've, we've done it that way before. I think now we can challenge some of our assumptions because of this forced uh, new experience. I think we'll be able to put priority out there like say, okay, lift climate change up. And we've got the support to say, it's really okay to ask each other if we need to meet face to face and it becomes a practice. That's where, and, and there is an infrastructure of experience out there now with everybody having done this Zoom stuff that didn't exist before. So it truly is different. It truly does challenge our preconceptions and um, it does allow us to, I think, change some priorities or encourage us to do that. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, if there are no further comments, um, I would like to close the session here because we are running over time. Ah, all right. Yeah, I see the last hand raising, Mohammed. You are on mute. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, just um, a final comment. Uh, the leadership as a social phenomena it's not always a choice. Sometimes you have to lead at a certain moment of time, especially in crisis. Uh, I just wanted to ask about if you don't have a chance to choose, what should you do if the leadership is obl obliged for you? What should you do in this case? I'll uh, give an example for uh, Egypt, for example, on the level of the state. Sometimes during the history, we have no legitimized leadership and there were no substitutes, substitutes for us. What should we do in this case? Thank you very much.
Um, well, at the risk of opening up a, lo a long conversation there, uh, uh, on the complex issue, um, Mohammed, can you just indicate who is we in the, in the question? Uh, no, uh, I mean exactly that uh, the leadership needs a, 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 a way of uh, legitimization or uh, authority to lead. But sometimes you don't have this authority or uh, legitimization from the people, for example. So you have no substitute to choose. The circumstances puts you in a situation that you have to lead within it. How do you solve this dilemma? <laughs> well, then what you're positioning is not exactly a dilemma, Mohammed. It's it's because you're not that you're saying there's no choice. So, um, uh, if you put in a position in a situation where, where where you have no choice, then there is no dilemma. Um, and I think that that in 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 the situation of positions of power and authority, um, the. the the choice as to whether you're in that position or not is one thing. The choice as to what you do when in that position is, is a different question. So um, I think if the question is to the latter, then then there are some things here that, that um, I think that we've shared around risk uh, management, around building trust, um, around the ability to learn uh, uh, and about uh, um, your resilience and the resilience of those around you. There are things you can do, whether you choose to do those things or not. Um, is, and how you choose to do those things uh, depend on, on the environment you're in and, 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 and the, the, the culture that you're part of, the system that you're part of, uh, the tolerance it has for, for different practices. Um, and so recognizing the, the, the container in effect that you're part of um, is gonna have a big impact on that. But if it's about the former, if you're not given the choice, then, then, then uh, um, you know, that's a situation that, 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 that doesn't present itself as a dilemma. I don't know if there's anything else to add there. So uh, from, from our standpoint, I think we might want to round this off formally. Um, uh, I'm willing to stay on for a little while longer if we want to take, if someone to take some conversations forward. Um, does that make sense? Yes, yeah, yeah thanks, thank you. Thank you everybody. Thanks for being here with us today.